Hey guys, Brock Shield here, back with you with the next video in our series, The Great Gatsby. Without further ado, returning to The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. That's the one from Montenegro. To my astonishment, the thing, he, the thing had an authentic look. Ordery di, di Dinello ran the circular reg, legend. Montenegro, Nicholas Rex. Turn it. Major J. Gatsby, I read, for valor extraordinary. Here's another thing I always carry, a souvenir of, my, of Oxford days. It was taken in Trinity Quad. The man on my left is now the Earl of Dorcaster. It was a photograph of half a dozen young men in blazers, loafing in an archway through which were visible a host of spires. There was Gatsby, looking a little, not much younger, with a cricket bat in his hand. Then it was all true. I saw the skins of tigers flaming in his palace on the Grand Canal. I saw him opening a chest of rubies to ease with their crimson-lighted depths, the gnawings of his broken heart. I'm going to make a big request of you today, he said, pocketing his souvenirs with satisfaction. So I thought you ought to, to know something about me. I didn't want you to think I was just some nobody. You see, I usually find myself among strangers because I drift here and there, trying to forget the sad thing that happened to me. He hesitated. You'll hear about it this afternoon. At lunch? No, this afternoon. I happen to find out that you're talking, taking Miss Baker to tea. Do you mean you're in love with Miss Baker? No, old sport, I'm not. But Miss Baker has kindly consented to speak to you about this matter. I hadn't the faintest idea of what this matter was. But I was more annoyed than interested. I hadn't asked Jordan to tea in order to discuss Mr. J. Gatsby. I was sure the request would be something utterly fantastic, and for a moment I was sorry I'd ever set foot upon his overpopulated lawn. He wouldn't say another word. His correctness grew on him as he neared the city. We passed Port Roosevelt, where there was a glimpse of red-belted ocean-going ships and sped along a cobbled slum lined with the dark, undeserted saloons of the faded gilt 1900s. Then the valley of ashes opened out on both sides of us, and I had a glimpse of Mrs. Wilson straining at the garage pump with paint with panting vitality as we went by. With fenders spread like wings, we scattered light through half Astoria, only half, for as we twisted among the pillars of the elevated, I heard the familiar chuck chuck spat of a motorcycle and frantic a frantic policeman rode alongside all right old sport called gatsby we slowed down taking a white card from his wallet as he waved it before the man's eyes right you are agreed the policeman tipping his cap know you next time mr gatsby excuse me what was that I inquired. The picture of Oxford? I was able to do Commissioner a favor once, and he sends me a Christmas card every year. Over the great bridge, with the sunlight through the girders, making a constant flicker upon the moving cars, with the city rising up across the river in white heaps and sugar lumps all built with a white with a wish out of non olfactory money. The city scene from the Queensborough Bridge is always the city scene for the first time, in its first wild promise of all the mystery and beauty in the world. A dead man passed us in a hearse heaped with balloons, the blooms, followed by two carriages with drawn blinds and by more cheerful carriages for friends. The friends looked out at us with the tragic eyes and short upper lips of southeastern Europe and I was glad that the sight of the Gatsby splendid car was included in their somber holiday. As we crossed Blackwell's Island, a limousine passed us, driven by a white chauffeur, in which sat three 
two bucks and a girl. I laughed aloud as the yokes of their eyeballs roared toward us in a haughty rivalry. Anything can happen now that we've slid over this bridge, I thought. Anything at all. Even Gatsby could happen without any particular wonder. Roaring noon in a well-fanned 42nd Street cellar, I met Gatsby for lunch. Blinking away the brightness of the street outside, my eyes picked him out obscurely in the anteroom, talking to another man. Excuse me, just one second. Mr. Carowan, this is my friend, Mr. Wolfsham. A small, flat-nosed Jew raised his large head and regarded me with two fine growths of hair which luxuriated in either nostril. After a moment, I discovered his tiny eyes in the half-darkness. So I took one look at him, said Mr. Wolfsham, shaking my hand earnestly. And what do you think I did? What? I inquired politely. But evidently he was not addressing me, for he dropped my hand and covered Gatsby with his expressive nose. I handed the money to Katsper, and I said, I said, all right, Katsper, don't pay him a penny till he shuts his mouth. He shut it then and there. Gatsby took an arm of each of us and moved forward into the restaurant, whereupon Mr. Wolfsheim swallowed a new sentence. He was starting and lapsed into a sonumbratulatory abstraction. Hi, balls, asked the head waiter. This is a nice restaurant here, said Mr. Wolfsheim, looking at the Presbyterian nymphs on the ceiling. But I like across the street better. Yes, highballs, agreed Gatsby, and then to Mr. Wolfsheim. It's too hot over there. Hot and small, yes, said Mr. Wolfsheim, but full of memories. What place is that? I asked. The old metropole. The old metropole, brooded Mr. Wolfsheim gloomily, filled with faces dead and gone. Filled with friends gone now forever. I can't forget so long as I lived that night. They, as I lived the night, they shot Rosie Rosenthal there. It was six of us at the table, and Rosie had to eat and drunk a lot all evening. When it was almost morning, the waiter came up to him with a funny look and says, Somebody wants to speak to him outside. All right, says Rosie, and begins to get up, and I pulled him down in his chair. Let the bastards come here if they want you, Rosie, but don't you, so help me, move outside this room. It was four o'clock in the morning, and if we'd raised the blinds, we'd have seen daylight. Did he go? I asked innocently. Sure, he went. Mr. Wolfsham's nose flashed at me indignantly. He turned around in the door and says, Don't let that waiter take away my coffee. Then he went out on the sidewalk, and they shot him three times in his full belly and drove away. Four of them were electrocuted, I said, remembering. Five with Becker. His nostrils turned to me in an interested way. I understand that you're looking for a business connection. The juxtaposition of these two remarks was startling. Gatsby answered for me. Oh, no, he exclaimed. This isn't the man. No, Mr. Wolfsheim seemed disappointed. This is just a friend. I told you we'd talk about that some other time. I beg your pardon, said Mr. Wolfsheim. I had a wrong man. A succulent hash arrived, and Mr. Wolfsheim, forgetting the more sentimental atmosphere of the old metropole, began to eat with ferocious delicacy. His eyes, meanwhile, roved very slowly around the room. He completed the arc by turning to inspect the people directly behind him. Behind. I think that, except for my presence, he would have taken one short glance beneath our table. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. 
Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.